Mike, did anybody make a proper introduction of you? I don't know. Okay, let's do that. So you run a company called Venture Lab that's based in San Francisco. You spend time really traveling the world, but based in San Francisco. Do you want to talk a little bit about the genesis of Venture Lab and a little bit about your background as well, just to give people some perspective? Sure. So Venture Lab is a early stage cross-market VC. We invest in about 12 companies a year around specific sectors and specific positions in each market. What's unique about us is that we go very early, usually first money in, and we will actually help operate the companies aside the founders to help them execute from idea all the way through launch, revenue, uh, new geographic market. And so three things make us unique. One, that we are, are hands-on, truly hands-on. We're early stage and that we specifically invest with the intention of bringing companies to new geographic markets. So we're heavily invested in Southeast Asia, US right now, uh, mostly, mostly those two markets. Got it. Okay, so this talk is really supposed to be about bridging the gap between Southeast Asia and the United States, which I like to say is no longer just a theoretical construct. This is something that's actually going to happen, and I feel like you're actually going to start driving some of that as well. But more than that, it's really just all cross-border investment is really starting to take off. And I think there's a unique opportunity to do something in this cross-border VC space, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that, because this really hasn't been possible prior. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the history of venture capital, and you look at the history of startups in different ecosystems. You've had the US ecosystem, of course, and that's been a mature ecosystem, but you look at the emergence in the last three years of new startup ecosystems from anywhere from Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, to, to Southeast Asia, to um, even Lebanon, you know, in these traditionally non, you know, ecosystems that don't have as much innovation. So the emergence of all these amazing ecosystems leads to an opportunity where you can invest and understand each market for the reasons that they exist. Uh, and, you know, and for startups, it also means for a company that is maybe less than a year old, there's an opportunity to actually bridge to new ecosystems in a way that they couldn't have done even two years ago. Do you want to talk a little bit about what's changed? So what's made that opportunity possible? And also try to explain a little bit about how it is different to invest in a company because you've done this and build a company in Malaysia as compared to building a company in San Francisco or in Los Angeles? Sure, so the advantage of looking at the emergence of new ecosystems and across different markets is that every market is unique. So most companies will start building a product, a founder will have a really great vision, a really deep knowledge in their vertical, and there might be something with the market where the market timing isn't right, the market opportunity isn't right, uh, or maybe they don't have the right relationships, et cetera. The advantage of looking at different markets is that right now you can access those markets very cheaply. Uh, and there's a lot of kind of connected ecosystems, so you have a lot of cross-border stuff, like SF Asia as an organization in San Francisco that specifically moves startups uh, and connects startups with government and investors in new markets. And so if your market timing isn't actually right, there's an opportunity to look at and find the best match, that, find the market that best matches what you offer, irregardless of whether it's your home market. You're not locked into that, so if your market timing is off, you actually might have a second or third life in a different market. Um, so yeah. what, do you, what do you do to keep in touch with what's going on in those other markets? I mean, are you constantly traveling or do you have partners in other places? How do you handle that? So I think you need to understand each market for why it's differentiated. So for example, you know, there's a lot of VC money going to Indonesia right now and a lot of it's going into consumer, consumer internet. And actually I think consumer internet is the wrong place to be putting money in in that market, because if you look at the cultural structure, the business structure, the just the overall cultural behaviors as well, it doesn't quite fit that yet. But if you were going to go to Indonesia for infrastructure, for transactional enablement, um, uh, fintech, there's a lot of opportunity there, logistics, a lot of opportunity there. Versus Vietnam has a really interesting skew towards mobile right now. Uh, Thailand has a really interesting skew towards consumer goods and, um, and consumer culture. So there's a lot of opportunities there. I think you need to be on the ground. I think anytime you want to go into a new market, you need to have the right relationships, or at least have the right perspective in saying, not just I want to go to a specific market, but I understand specifically why that market fits me as well as I fit that. Do you want to talk about the clusters at all and how those clusters actually help you actuate these investments and build these companies, and how that makes Venture Lab a unique prospect? Sure, so, so we're very different than a traditional VC. So most VCs are fund-based. They will 
look for a number of portfolio investments across the market, look, look for diversification. They're playing a numbers game. We're actually playing more of a strategic game in the sense that we will define a cluster in a specific vertical. So for example, let's say digital health IoT. And within that market, we say, okay, well, what is happening right now in that market? And what are the factors and the technologies driving that market now? But what does that lead to in the next 24 months? Based on understanding that specific vertical, we'll look for specific mechanisms or key points in, the, in, that, in that cluster. So for example, in digital health IoT, it won't be hardware. It's actually looking at intelligence and the application of data uh, to individuals at scale looking at um, um, uh, middleware and, and enablement technologies between hardware and software. So um, based on that understanding, we'll say, okay, well, what companies are doing that that can also apply to both mature and emerging markets, and that will allow us to look for a high value startup that we can bring to new countries. So we have companies from the US that we're taking to Southeast Asia. We have companies from Southeast Asia that we're taking to the US and Europe. And the cluster focus allows us to have a very high value to both a startup and to secure our investment because the idea is that in the earliest stages of a startup, pre-series A, money is your least valuable resource. Yeah, I was going to say, do you want to yeah. talk a little bit about this? This whole concept of hands-on is something that gets talked about way too much and yet doesn't <laughs> actually happen. Do you want to talk in detail a little bit about how you do that and relate it to the cross-border investments that you make just so people can get a better understanding about the non-triviality? It's fundamental execution, right? Like, like I was saying earlier, you know, when you make when a when a startup comes at founding and they go up to Series A, Series A you have numbers, you have you have EBITDA, you have revenue, you have all these metrics that tell you where the company is going and why. The definition of what their product offering is and how they're executing is really well defined and really well, usually you know smoothly executing. So you're putting more you know, more money means more fuel into the engine. But previous to Series A, typically the trajectory, the growth, the curve, the, the, um, how the company executes is less to do with money and more to do with a know-how, um, experience, relationships. Can they get a key customer in? Do they understand why they, why not they fit their market? And so the idea is that all of that risk in that early stage is actually tied to execution, not tied to money. So for us, if we look at a company and we're not able to add direct hands-on value. And what I mean by that is not just saying, hey, I've invested in your company, and by the way, I know someone at this other company that's a good investor or customer for you, and I'll make the relationship. It's actually to say, hey, I've invested in your company, I understand where you need to go, and we have a, a partner in this new market that we will go put a deal together for you, and we will help you close that deal, or we will bring follow-on capital, or we will actually get you that customer signed up. So to a certain extent, you actually become an operating partner. And we are an operating VC, yeah. That's what I want so to we, say. So we, yeah, we actually will we'll work with the companies up until their series yeah, A. But, okay, but again, just to be specific, we, we hear a lot about operating venture capitalists, but few of them actually, and some of them do do it, and they do it well, but very few of them actually do it the way you do from a cross-border perspective, yeah? Yeah, because the idea is that, I mean, it's kind of a self-serving in a sense. A little bit. Um, because, again, all that risk in the early stages execution, and if, let's say, we invest in a company in the U.S. and then just timing is really off, well, they might have a huge value in the Philippines. So we either give a startup nine lives or we can actually sell a startup nine times to different markets. So it just manages our risk and, and it increases the revenue. So it's a win-win for both the entrepreneur, us as an investor, and us as an operator. Yeah, because you're obviously going to bring in some skills that they would have no way to develop or would take them way too long to develop. And since um, you're already operating in other companies, it allows them to to get that help straight away. Yeah, because fundamentally most, most entrepreneurs know their product very, very, very well. Yeah, exactly. What they're usually missing is key relationships, how to structure the company, how to raise money, when to raise money, why, uh, what format, um, how do they get into the market, how do they market themselves, how do they drive PR, um, how do they optimize in their revenue, you know, are they looking at data, are they looking at machine learning, are they looking at things that build on top of the initial offering. And so by understanding how to build the business side while helping them with the product as well. You know, the idea of a pivot, I think if you have to pivot, you fundamentally failed in some capacity. Right. So the idea is that instead of pivoting after you've spent your first amount of money and two years of your life or six months or a year, why not go through the fundamentals up front and understand both the near term and the long term? It feels like a much better business model to me. Well, it's really, if you think about it, it's a private equity approach. You know, private equity right. turnovers. Exactly. You know, when a private equity goes into a company, they'll take the company over, they'll restructure the management, and they're going to go bring in accounts, and they're going to basically drive revenue and profitability. And that's a turnaround. The difference is we're doing that, but we're doing that up front with the founders in a complementary way. So is it your opinion that with the world basically awash in cheap money, 
even <clears throat> even in listed markets and in fixed income markets globally with interest rates so there just seems to be money everywhere. Would you posit that money is the least valuable thing that an investor can give to any company? And is it even more valued if you're investing in a country that's not your home country, so from a cross-border perspective? I, I, think, I think, so there, I was at pre-money last week in San Francisco with Dave McClure and, and the 500, and I love what they're doing. And, um, but we were in a room and there were some other VCs that said, or someone asked, they were like, is the first $500,000 for a startup, is that, is that green? Do they really care where it comes from? And a lot, most of the investors in the room said, no, it doesn't matter where it comes from. Money is money is money. The first 500 is too, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And my argument is actually the first 500 is the most critical because what comes along with that money actually has the biggest effect on the company. If it's, if, if it's a positive and they can bring other relationships to the table, there's a huge outcome on, to the company because the company is malleable. There has to be. Or it could be a negative. Right. So, I mean, I mean, you look at all, the other issue I think in, in the VC scene right now is that you have so much non-technology money flowing in the tech. I mean, Fidelity's putting a billion dollars in the, in, the early, in, the, in the technology and startups, and, and, and that's an issue because... Well, it is because you have what's traditionally been called smart money mm -hmm. turning into dumb money. Well, it's, it's, there's no value. They don't understand what they're investing at in. At all. Not saying yeah. Fidelity, but there's a lot of money in the, in, the, in the space. In the system, yeah. Um, and then it's also, it's an illiquid asset, right? So when you invest in a company, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. No. And so I think for entrepreneurs especially, yeah. I think the first money you raise is the most important because it has the most potential effect on your outcome. It would have to though, right? And again, if you're operating inside the company at that stage of investment, it's going to have a much larger impact than just having 500 grand. Positive or negative, right? Yeah, positive I mean, In the best cases, somewhere. maybe it's benign. Yeah. But, but in most cases, it's not. So do you want to spend a little more time talking about the differences in your mind about how early stage versus medium stage and late stage investing, and when I say late stage, I mean pre-series A or series A, and how that differentiates across borders. Sure, so I mean, especially in emerging ecosystems like Southeast Asia, uh, if you understand the nature of the markets, you're able to build in a ton of advantages to both the startup and yourself as an investor. Um, again, pre-series A, the outcome of the company hasn't been defined, how it makes money, all that stuff is all up for grabs. So if most of the risk is in execution, right you can manage that risk by actually helping execute. And I think in emerging markets, it's even more critical because you have a lot of raw talent, but there's been less cycles of exits and failures and successes. So you have less experience on how to execute in that. So I think, uh, you know, pre-Series A, the biggest advantage you can do as an investor is, is help the companies build right uh, and build versus just invest. And I think, um, you know, post-Series A, Again, trajectory set, money is the fuel at that point, and that's a different play. Well, because post-series A, the path actually for that partic any particular company should be relatively set. Otherwise, they shouldn't be taking post-series A investment. Or well, they're doing a pivot, and then it's a whole yeah, different thing. Yeah, they might be. But even then, they should still know where they're going, I'm thinking. Yes. Okay. So uh, can you talk a little bit more about your travel schedule like where do you, what, and what you think your next type of cross-border investments are going to be? Yeah, so I mean, right now... Because what you've done so far, right, is user engagement. Some ad stuff, yes. some user engagement stuff. We have three clusters that we're investing in, right. three to five companies each. Um, we're wrapping up our consumer engagement, user engagement cluster of companies. Uh, we're now investing in digital health IoT, specifically the data and the infrastructure side of things. We're also investing in consumer uh, mobile commerce. So technologies and platforms that drive uh, traditionally offline or um, local transactions. So for us, that's a huge opportunity, especially in Southeast Asia. And so we're looking for one or two companies in each one. We already have about two picked in each one, and we're looking for about two more in each one. Got it. Yeah. Um, so actually, so we wanted this to be more of a discussion. So what we're going to do is after this panel, immediately we're going to go over to the workshop room, and for about half an hour, we're going to have an open discussion on anything from investing in regional plays across different uh, local ecosystems, cross market what VCs are looking for, especially when you have VCs that are not from your market coming in. You have a lot of Japanese VCs investing in Southeast Asia, for example. Right, so we'll, have, um, a, we'll yeah. have a representative Japanese investor there who can maybe give us some insight into why they've decided to invest cross-border. And uh, they've been doing this for a while. So yeah, I so if anyone really wants to join us uh, for more of a discussion, open, open questions and whatnot, we'll be doing that uh, right now in the next room at the workshop room. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mike.